But now let's take you to Parliament, where Parliament uh, leadership of the majority and minority are addressing the public um, ahead of the second meeting of the first session of the eighth Parliament, as you can see in your shot, Harun Idris, the minority leader, is at the podium. Let's join them now. I'm aware that this Parliament will consider presence nominee for deputy ministerial positions. Indeed, we are starting any moment after this uh, uh, interaction with the media group. We will take Minister of State and two or three other deputies. We intend to take them for a day, depending upon what COVID protocols and their own answers will be, whether they give us long or short uh, answers. But for you to know that deputy ministers are not ministers within the meaning of the 1992 Constitution and are just there to assist ministers who are also assisting the president in the performance of their duties. So as and when the reports of the appointments committee is ready, we will readily and gladly share them with you. My request to this August group is that there are many commentaries outside there Parliament is not appreciated, our sacrifices are not noticed many at times, and therefore you have a responsibility to report the sacrifices of members of Parliament and the work we do and the hard work we do to get a number of bills passed. Sometimes we sit up to 2, 4 a.m. This is not even reported and it's as if all is well at all times with members of Parliament. Regarding the work of the Appointments Committee, I'm demanding through you to the public that any member of the public who has any credible information on any nominee in breach of the Constitution or not meeting minimum criminal threshold or has not satisfied the requirement to be minister, not to hesitate to share same with the speaker, the chairman of the committee and all other members of the committee. I also believe that, uh, uh, speaking for the, uh, my group in Parliament, we will be demanding greater oversight. The exercise of over oversight responsibilities, largely in Ghana, a minority function, as people in the executive or ministers are not able to question the president because they risk losing their job if they did so. I cannot be dismissed by the president tomorrow, so I can be critical of him on any matter and demand what is required of him in the pursuit of his mandate under the 1992 constitution. So we strengthen oversight as a minority. Where we need to cooperate, we will cooperate. Where we need to be uncompromising, we would be uncompromising. And where we need to protect the public interest, not partisan interest clothed in public interest will do exactly that. We intend to hold the executive accountable to the happenings which happened in Parliament on 7 January prior to the swearing in of the Speaker in order that we can make recommendations that will reform and make us have a better Parliament. You are already aware that myself and the Majority Leader are in consultation improving a motion to demand for the debts of December 7th. At least I know of seven. I know of uh, Ayarik uh, in Techma and many others. We intend to move a motion to investigate it and in order to recommend that in future no life should be lost as we undertake the mandatory four-year accountability to the electorate as president, as members of parliament. It should be a normal thing that should uh, happen. I'm aware that the leader of government business have filed some private members motion on some constitutional amendment. I disagree with him and I disagree with his thinking on it, but it's something that we all should look at. You know, he's seeking to amend Article 97 of the Constitution to allow for an incumbent or sitting member of parliament to preside as Speaker of Parliament. That will mean that the Speaker will now have a vote I disagree with his process and procedure because the Constitution in Article 291, 292 provides elaborate provisions how the Constitution should be amended. So first of all, my disagreement with him is whether a major issue such as a constitutional amendment should even come by a private member's motion. Then my second objection is procedural. Standing Order 95 abhors anticipating a bill. That motion anticipates a constitutional 
amendment bill. And I think that when we get there, we'll be able to cross the bridge. One of the important things we need to do as parliament and the leader is assured of my cooperation is how do we work to improve public sector institutions and their governance to respond to COVID and post-COVID. That's why I have no hesitation calling on President Nana Akufuado, knowing that he has only three and a half years now as mandate to be president of Ghana, the constitution gives him a limit. He should focus on Ghana beyond COVID and not Ghana beyond it. He cannot achieve a Ghana beyond it within three and a half years. So a Ghana beyond COVID, I'm sure he will be able to uh, uh, achieve it. We also intend to hold government accountable to matters such as the frontier health services. We we'll file some important questions to demand answers. How much have accrued to that partnership? How has that been utilized? How has the state of Ghana benefited in its collective uh, effort to fight COVID? We also intend to find out from the Minister of Finance through questions, and I expect members to take full advantage of statements and questions to elucidate answers from ministers and members of the executive on matters that affect their constituent, exercising their representation function and also holding the executive uh, accountable. Now, there are other matters uh, relating to uh, uh, who demand some other probe into the handling of this galamsey thing. You know, leader, Chairman Messer is uh, very brilliant. You saw his answer on the floor of parliament. He said, demobilize. So I didn't find immediate responses to him. I'm now looking for what to do with demobilizing. So when you hear President Akufuado uh, say that go to court, ex anti judicial powers are not vested in the president. You don't breach human rights and tell the person that go and recover their right in court. That's not the proper way to exercise executive uh, authority. And therefore, the president is accordingly reminded that his powers and the constitutions are subject to the laws of Ghana, subject to the constitution of Ghana, and subject to he respecting the fundamental rights and freedoms of Ghanaians, including the right of any Ghanaian to own an excavator. It's a right. Maybe you people haven't even explored it further. It's a right, right to ownership, to own an excavator. And I'm not aware of any law in Ghana which permits burning of excavators. If you cannot identify the person driving it, go to the port who brought it in. And probably to improve it, we should now add that any person clearing an excavator must sign an undertaking that it will not be used for purposes of illegal mining. Then when he is in breach of it, or you come to parliament for us to give you the mandate to ban excavators. But as at this morning, we have not clothed any president of Ghana with powers to ban excavators. I find that an, an exercise in excess of uh, the president's uh, power and he is not above the law, he is not above the constitution of Ghana. He is to fight Galamsey. And we are adding him with him in fighting the menace because it does have major implications on the environment, particularly on our water body. He also must be interested in finding out who licensed them, who gave those licenses, when were they given. So we are demanding greater transparency, even in the president's quest to fight Galamsey. We are demanding more uh, transparency. I hear a gentleman was picked up here uh, some few days ago at Flagstaff House, the one Damwa. We are following the case closely, and nobody should make an attempt to cover up what his doings have been relative to his uh, engagement or involvement in Galamsey. You know what I'm talking about. So uh, uh, he was picked up by national security. They are trying to cover up. We are following very closely. So you see, the president is fighting his own men. The illegal Galamsey people, we are beginning to know them, who they are. And they are all acting on the breath and strength that our government is in power and our government is ruling. Let him deal decisively with them, and he has our full support in doing it, but not supporting him in saying that go to court after excavators have been uh, banned. So largely to assure leader that we are available to support him, the economy is uh, reeling under, uh, they don't want me to say the economy is broke, but we are broke because uh, 
corporations have not, chief executive of government institutions have not been appointed, boards have not been appointed, you are leaving that power to be exercised by ministers. That is wrong in, in, in for essence and purposes of good governance. You cannot expect ministers to come and become board chairmen and board members in giving approval. I think that he must act and act timely in getting the boards properly constituted and chief executives appointed uh, accordingly so that the state can function and function well. It does not appear that he is lubricating the administrative uh, wheels of the state of governance to run and run faster. And we are reminding him that he should be up to the tax. So leader, we are here, we would cooperate as I said, when we have to cooperate, we will be uncompromising where we have to be. We cannot afford to fail the Ghanaian people in holding the government and our government collectively accountable to his actions, to his deeds, and to his uh, excesses. So, gentlemen of the media, report as well. I see some of you sometimes, your headlines, your headlines don't sit with the body of what you publish. And I should be honest with you, uh, I, have, I have made this observation sometimes, but somebody got back to me. Uh, Director of Public Affairs, if you would just take your phone and go to Ghana Web, all the news is about uh, that category of people in Ghana. So the state of Ghana is lost, and what we are doing as a country is lost. You see, the first point of call of any foreigner when he Googles Ghana Web, or any of you, any major media hub, must be one which is positive about the state and the republic. I think that uh, notwithstanding, we have a peaceful country. We remain an oasis of peace. I've had opportunity to call on the religious leaders to preserve the religious harmony and peace in our country, not to sacrifice it on the altar of uh, uh, what I call uh, uh, religious uh, superiority or chauvinism. Uh, that is not the place for Ghana. We've, we've kept together well, and we are the admiration of uh, many, many countries. And we should endeavor, even in our differences, to keep the peace and stability of the country as one peaceful country which recognizes the freedom of uh, belief, freedom of uh, religion. I have said that the rights of a person are not divisible that you enjoy the right when you are home and when you are in school, you are not entitled to the right. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Honorable Harry Nagriso. And now it's the turn of the leader of government business, the Honorable Osaichi Mensa Bonsu, to um, give us um, his remarks. The Honorable Osaichi Mensa Bonsu will now address us. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Director of Programs. Let me apologize for my lateness. I had to be in consultation and some conversation with uh, some um, persons who may be of relevance to the minority leader. <laughs> the minority leader is uh, indicating to us that perhaps when we come to such meetings, I should speak ahead of him. I think it makes some sense and, uh, because I have to give out the, um, the relevant information in respect of what business that we must be transacting at a particular meeting. But um, as usual, um, he exhibited the fact that uh, eternally and persistently he cannot kill himself of the diarrhea of the Buka cavity, and I don't intend to. <laughs> I don't intend to offer assistance in that at all. But, uh, Doctor Programs, let me express my own appreciation for this program. I think it's. Uh, 
a well thought out initiative by the Public Affairs Department, which um, requires of us to comment and indeed to show appreciation to you um, in pressing for this ingenious way of putting out before the public what it is that a parliament at the beginning of any meeting will be doing. I think that once we're able to do that and uh, put it out there uh, to our people, they may begin to digest the information that we put out there. And in some cases, you'll see some people would want to offer some assistance to us or provide some relevant information, even if it relates to uh, the evolution of a policy, bills that we intend to, um, to craft uh, the implementation of projects, they may be offering some contributions which would enrich our democratic governance. So I think that is, is a good endeavor, and we must um, um, perhaps be able to get it out there uh, before Parliament even resumes. I think that would be a better arrangement than this, but better than late than never. So into our second week, if we have to uh, meet the media and through them communicate to the people that we represent, I think it would be, be good for us. But as the minority leader indicated, the responsibilities, the principal responsibilities of the department are set out in various statutes, including the constitution the um, representation function of members of parliament, the deliberative functions, information transmission functions, the power of peers functions, the oversight, the legislation functions of members of parliament. To what extent do our people appreciate what members of parliament do? And I think the burden lies very much on the shoulders of the media, especially the media in parliament to let people know what enterprise that we commit ourselves to here. And I'm saying so because in the particular case of some of the established members of parliament, like um, the Honorable Abdallah, who was the chairman of the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee, and who was so much committed to assisting in the crafting of important bills in this house, we have lost because somebody went into his backyard and started digging potholes and made life uncomfortable for him. Rambo Shaibu Alassan, one of the key members when it came to crafting bills, he literally went and lost in his primaries. And yet, one of the most astute members of parliament, very experienced very deep, he lost because people in the constituency and indeed in Ghana in general don't appreciate the work of members of parliament. So the popular refrain in his backyard was oh, to replace him with a person of equal value or just because we want to get rid of him. Eight years ago, we needed to go and salvage his, his cause. Because some of us, even though I don't belong to the same party with the Honorable Yilishwe, I know that is a veritable asset to Parliament. So we had to go there and salvage him, including even the current speaker. So I think you in the media should assist us because it becomes self-serving if a certain chairman Zabunsu is giving uh, a microphone and he speaks to what good cause the members of parliament commit to, for which reason we say to ourselves, to the populace, to retain the established members of parliament. It's self-serving. And people begin to think that oh, he himself wants to be there until the kingdom come. And because of that, is resorting to this advocacy. But as you do know, in Parliament today, 
when we come to talking about established members of parliament who are adding value to the business of parliament. A certain Harun Idrusu will be mentioned. A certain Osechi Mensa Konsubi will be mentioned. Harun Idrusu is not an instant product. He came not yesterday, but the day before yesterday. I came four days ago. So, in Parliament, the longer a person stays, the better. He serves not only his constituents, but Parliament as an institution, and indeed the Republic as a corporate institution. So, I would, I would want to urge that you play a big role in shaping the opinions of our people, including in particular the political parties on the wings of which we come to Parliament, and indeed the general populace. So, distinguished members of the media, I think our work is cut out for us. There's a lot for us to do together with Parliament as an arm of government to improve our democratic governance. The minority leader has spoken eloquently about um, people chancing on uh, excavators and uh, resorting to burning them. And he says there is, there is no law that allows for that. The law provides that if an operator using an, an excavator um, illegally is chanced upon, that person must be arrested. But where you have situations as is happening now, where you go to everybody, where the excavator is not supposed to be there in the first place, and the person who is operating it, upon hearing that you are advancing, vanishes, and then removes the, the vital part. If you want to remove it, you can't remove it. What do you do? As I said to Parliament, you further demobilize. <laughs> you further demobilize. So I, 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 I have no qualms in my mind. Look, what is an excavator supposed to be used for? Dredging in the construction of roads. But in the construction of roads, the excavator as an equipment is the least used equipment. For what? One is just for uh, the excavation of drains. And if they have to build bridges, use it to excavate, the, uh, to dredge the, the stream before they construct the bridges. That's what they use them for. How can you have in this country excavators now numbering over 5,000? What are they using them for? Last week, on my way to Kumasi, at Asaman, Asaman Tamfoye, the the community before, that is from Accra, before Enyinem. When we got there, we saw an excavator on a low loader that was branching off into <laughs> one village. And the whole population in the village had come out and were shouting, walk on him, walk on him. What are they doing? I want to know what they are doing with it. Today, streams feeding rivers have been diverted and hugely polluted. Look, if you, if you dig the topsoil two feet, it takes 200 years for the soil to replenish itself. If you dug 100 meters, how long is it going to take? 
minerals are vested. Minerals on the on the on the surface of the the ground in water bodies underneath the soil are all vested in the president on behalf of the state. You heard what uh, um, the Dr. Nachia, Ali Nachia, the discovery he made in Dubai, that for just one year, exports of gold to Dubai amounted to $2.5 billion. What was the share of the state in that? Nothing. Nothing. Because these galamseyes don't pay tax on anything. They smuggle whatever they earn or they, they, they chance upon to foreign countries. We must, we must be candid with ourselves. I don't know how many of us went to um, where Dr. Rashid Ra Draman through a step I was demonstrating to us at the forecourt of Parliament. The data fair. At the turn of the 20th century, 20th century, the forest cover of this country was 8.5 million hectares. At the turn of the 21st century, it had dwindled to 1.5 million hectares. Now, within the past 10 years, no thanks to Galamse. The past 10 years, we have lost 500,000 hectares of forest cover. Today, as we speak, the forest cover of this country is less than 600,000 hectares. Where are we going as a country? And we think these activities should not be stopped. I beg to disagree, the Honorable Minority Leader. I beg to disagree. When, when President Mahama wanted to resurrect the Commander Sugar Factory, I said in Parliament that it was going to be an exercise in futility. Where are we now as a country? It can't produce anything. Commander, it can't produce anything. The reason is simple. One, you know, they were fetching raw water from the Pra River to irrigate the farmlands. The raw water now is turned into mud. You can't pump it and use it to irrigate the, the, the farmlands. No longer. And even if you purify it, then the production cost will be unimaginable. But quite apart from that, you can't purge the water of the cyanide so what use it? You can do that. Where in the world do they use treated water for irrigation purposes? And that's why I warned that it wasn't going to be feasible. An investor brought 35 million. Where are we? Nobody can put that factory to good use. Nobody. So we must, we must confront reality. We can't go on like this. And don't forget that the very, the very preamble of this constitution provides that we, the people of Ghana, in the exercise of our natural and inalienable right to establish a framework of government which are secure for ourselves and posterity, generations of tomorrow, and the days after tomorrow, the blessings of liberty, equality of opportunity and prosperity. What equality of opportunity are we granting them when we are causing such havoc to the environment? What prosperity are we according them when we are doing this today? Farmlands are going. I have a farm a cocoa farm and a teak farm. 
at a senior dwem in the constituency of uh, Keno Hene Japan. They said I should, because they had discovered some gold in my farm, that I should, I should sell it to them. I said I wouldn't. You know what they did? They went and dug around the farm. So we can't enter. <laughs> you can't enter the farm. Because those of them, the contiguous farms, they've sold it to them. Now I can't enter my own farm. If I have to go there, I must go by a boat. <laughs> Is that what we want to do to ourselves? Please. Reality check. Let's do what is right. My colleagues, am I, am I digressing? The minority leader is saying that the economy is broke. <laughs> yes, we are not doing as well as maybe we are doing in 2019. That's a fact. Because of COVID, that's a fact. But it is also a fact that in the sub-region, Ghana's economy emerged the second strongest, even within the, the, um, the space of COVID. The only country that had shown us is Sierra Leone, whose economy grew by 1.1%. But Sierra Leone didn't do what we did. That is, um, government meeting people halfway in the supply and usage of electricity and water, the food rations that were given. They didn't do all those things. We made the second strongest. So at least we've done well. Our human institution, we could have done better. I must admit. I must admit. So let's contribute to enrich this. And I would urge, in respect of the issue raised by the minority leader about um, the, the burning of excavators. What are parliamentary committees meant for? They should investigate. And if it will lead to enriching our laws, so be it. That is why parliament exists. The chairman, is uh, chairman is seated. You, can, you will not have media coverage. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the people to cover our way. <laughs> Anyway, but I'll end up in the GV. But having said so, colleagues, um, as you heard the minority leader indicate, the agenda for this meeting is a tall one. Um, the nodal issues include the vetting that is going to start, the Minister of State to begin, Charles Edouard to begin, other deputy ministers to follow, and of, of course, the vetting of the special prosecutor nominee. And apart from that, this meeting is the meeting for bills. There are monumental bills that are going to come to us. The affirmative action bill. Majesty, please, I think he really has to go. Yeah. So, the affirmative action bill, the aged persons bill, Ghana National Authority bill, advertising council bill, consumer protection bill, competition bill. Our stress on the affirmative action and the auto industry development council bill because of where we are in the production of uh, automobiles in the country. The supplementary appropriations bill that we coming because we're going to have a media review. Exemptions bill. We've been worrying about the huge exemptions that we've been giving to companies that come to operate in the country and they have having to import, especially uh, vehicles and equipment. We grant them exemptions when they finish their, their work. The equipment and the vehicles disappear from the system. And nobody pays any, any, any duties on them. I think it's something that, we, that should attract our attention. The Petroleum Revenue Management Amendment Bill. And that is something that I'm looking forward to. Why? Because when we discovered oil and fashioned out the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, we provided for GMPC, for instance, to be given some huge allocation. The time is up next year. So we need to define for ourselves what we are going to do with the allocations with GMPC. Are we going to continue as a country? What have they used allocations for? Have they assisted in 
the um, national development by the allocations? If not, can we take a portion of it from them and give them perhaps a portion? Because some, some of it necessarily will have to be given to them. We've seen in this country when allocations are made to GNPC and they've used them by way of what he calls social responsibility, inferring supporters of Black Stars to watch football matches. Have they been beneficial to us as a country? Lately, they've been building um, health facilities and so on, offering scholarships. To me, that is good. But we, as a country, have to give the money to GMPC in order for them to offer scholarships. When we have a scholarship secretariat. So these are matters that we should be concerned about. Then the Ghana Road Fund bill, um, remember that uh, road tolls were increased by President Mills. Um, at the time, I think the southern vehicles were paying uh, 10 pesos, and it was increased to one city, an increase of about 900%. Uh, there was hue and cry. But then people saw that they were putting the money to good use, and the hue and cry subsided. 11 years down the lane, we have not increased it. Has the time arrived for us to increase it? And if we have to increase it, what are we going to put them to? What use are, they, are we going to put them to? And how are we going to ensure that the monies are collected? Today we see, when we get to the motorway, you see what happens. So many of the vehicles are, are, are um, passing by without paying. And those of them that pay, do they really pay back their amounts to the state? Um, Dr. Ali Nachia, in his delivery to us when we were interrogating the budget, told us that he knows of a lady who is um, um, at the toll gate and um, within three years after she was posted there, has built a house and a lady has married a man. She married a man. It was not a man who married the lady. So are we, are we having value for money? Or do we have to automate it in order to ensure that we have um, um, good amounts to the state for us to commit them to good use by way of uh, constructing and maintaining our roads? I was saying yesterday uh, to some people that um, the road network in the country inherited by the NDC was 69,000 kilometers. By the time they were leaving, they had improved it, increased by about 4,000 kilometers over an eight-year period. What it meant was that, on the average, every year they were expanding the frontiers by 500 kilometers. The MPP has assumed the reins of government. We are also further expanding. We need to maintain the roads that we construct. Oftentimes, we are not in a position to maintain the roads. We build them two years, they start, they start deteriorating. And maintenance is a difficult matter for us as a country. So we need to look at that. Local Roads Authority Bill, uh, Ghana Housing Authority, the Salt Authority Bill, Conduct of Public Officers Bill, uh, Office of Special Prosecutor Amendment Bill, Local Government Finance Bill, because Government now is offloading some financing to local assemblies. We need a law to regulate that. Um, and indeed, we can have monies from the local assemblies to develop. How many, how many houses exist in the various localities? What property rate is paid? And the other day, Do I see this? The director of finance, the director of public affairs is telling me not to see it, so I'll not see it. <laughs> but somebody, I will exaggerate so nobody sees. Somebody said that he owns about 300 houses. If it is true, if it was, the person was not merely boasting, and if it is true, the question to ask, where are they? What property rates do you pay to where they are situated? 
If you have strong institutions, they will zoom in on the person. We don't have strong institutions. He made a statement. I said, if you know, as my boss, I would die in 300. And then somebody could even go to the Auditor General. What declaration did you make? I said, declaration. Nobody follows up. Another time, somebody was, you know, on air before television cameras and exhibiting some diamonds that he, he, he had. He says, I own this worth of diamonds. Really? If the substance really is diamonds, how much tax have you paid on them to the state? The institutions don't follow that person. He must be chased. And nobody is saying anything. Colleagues, the media, Watergate, was exposed at the instance of the media working in the presidency. And that's why I keep saying that if you want to have relevance for yourself, working in parliament, you should begin to be specializing in some areas so that you are able to assist the various committees and also giving yourself relevance. That's how effective you will be. So that if you have to cover any story or any event and publish any article in your own name, you have relevance yourself. Where you are, the House of Parliament, unlike the executive, they only execute matters. You are properly positioned to explain to people what policies, what programs are emanating from government. And you own that. You're not able to do that. You cover, even at, in Parliament, when somebody has spoken, then after the person has spoken, you rush the person. Where's your test? What do you want to do? It's so, in my view, it's so unprofessional. You should listen, make your own notes, and then put the story out there. But if, after I've spoken in Parliament, you come to me and tell me I should give you, I should give you my script, you're not helping yourself. You're not developing your own talent. So, as I said, it's a tall order for us, this meeting. The next meeting is for the budget. So this is the meeting for programs, projects, and bills. Avail yourselves, you understand, have a deep knowledge of what business gets transacted in Parliament. In order to position you to really say to the populace. And once you're able to do that, you assist them in no mean way to make informed choices at appropriate time. I thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you very much, Majority Leader. We'll take the questions. I mean, we all agree that time is of the essence. So please, one man, one machine. And there shouldn't be any preamble or anything. Straight to the question. And then we, we so that we can get to it. We'll take them in tranches of four with the leaders there. So your name and where you're coming from? Uh, my name is Ahmed Usman Hamid Imam. Um, a member of the Parliamentary Press Corps, coming from Lima, also a Pinasa. Uh, leader, <laughs> there is this legal maxim that goes this way. He who comes to the pity must come with clearance. Uh, leader, on the 7th of December this year, the Parliament of Ghana embarrassed the entire nation. And from your submission and that of your colleague, uh, Minority Leader, clearly you were or you are calling on me to assist you so that the nation Ghana will appreciate what our MPs do in Parliament. Honorable leader, I think this is the best platform or forum for you to apologize to the entire nation for the embarrassment the house caused to us. I'm just making this to the
the issue of by election, where we are trying to control or manage the state best. Not only that, I believe that Mala Mutaka once upon a time raised an issue where, for example, if an MP from Party A passes on or resigns, that party should organize its own primaries so that the vacancy could be filled. Well, I'm a leader, and I, when I read that particular clause or that particular provision, it's an entrenched, it's an entrenched provision. I will read with you, if you don't mind, it should be part of your intended uh, constitutional amendment you have to push, so that this nation will be saved with the cost and the tension. Thank you very much. Samuel Sinti is from Ghana Justice. My question has to do with one of Samuel Sinti's AC from Ghana Justice. My question has to do with the financial control power of Parliament. We know that Parliament is clothed with the power to ensure that the public purse is controlled, and this is clearly fine in Chapter 13 of the 1990 Constitution. Looking at Article 174, that talks about tax exemption and waiver, and Article 178, that talks about how we spend uh, through the consolidated fund. If you look at the case of Kulu and others, the Sato in 2018, it clearly shows that Parliament has that power to ensure that the public purse is protected. We have done analysis on how Parliament exercises its uh, the supervisory responsibility over the executive and how the exec executive spends. And we have realized that there has not been much commitment on the part of Parliament to ensure that the public purse is protected. What are we going to see in this state Parliament in terms of protecting the public purse? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so my question is that uh, we appreciate. My name is Sophia Parting. I report for Atten County. Okay, so Lida, we would like to appreciate the fact that, I mean, any time that we have this kind of meeting, you encourage us to specialize in a special way so that we can report from Parliament adequately. But I also would like to know. Uh, or find out what are the opportunities that is available to us as parliamentary press for. May I, may I say something? Um, let us keep the welfare issues out of here so that we deal with the agenda issues and then we can deal with the welfare issues on a, on a separate occasion. So if you have another question, maybe you should ask with regards to the meeting. No, 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 it's not about welfare, it's about training. Yeah, it's training is part of welfare. Training is part of welfare. Parliament. 
start as some of us, you get to heaven. But if the outfit, the outfit can check with the MPs or come out with a modality, that when they go out, certain things that come from them shouldn't come out. Or they should seek consent before they go. I think when we do this uh, check and balances, image of will be enhanced. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. My name is Esko Ankama Arato, the new uh, newspaper. Um, on 7 January, Peter, um, uh, so just entered the chamber of parliament, which to me is tantamount to a coup d'etat at our meeting the other time with the leader, our latest meeting with the leadership. The minority leader promised that they would investigate that issue. Um, I wonder what had come of that investigation, and in if actually the any investigation was conducted at all. Um, I want to know what actually had come of that forceful entry of the military into the chamber of Parliament on 17th. Then. Mr. Amit, it's been quite a long while since I saw you. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know where you've been, but you introduced yourself as uh, being part of the parliamentary press. press call. No, I, I knew you were here, but for quite a long time now, I've not been seeing you. You took a leave. God bless your effort. <laughs> yes, um, you you relate to the events of seventh December and says that uh, we owe an apology to the nation. Seventh seventh January. Indeed, I will agree with you that it was uh, a day of shame for Ghana's parliament. I think we've already spoken to that matter, um, both the speaker and myself. And indeed, the minority leader also added his voice that it was such a shameful occurrence that it should not have further procreation. Um, We've already spoken to it, and so I'm not too sure that I have to go back and rehash. But um, if it is that you want it for an emphasis, I guess there's no shame in doing that, that uh, what happened was um, a day of shame, not only for the parliament of Ghana, but indeed for the entire country. Don't forget we were to swear in um, the elected president that day. And before then, we were to elect a speaker, for the speaker to swear in members of parliament, to occasion the swearing in of the president. And those events in the lead up to the swearing of the president certainly cannot be applauded. In the event, um, the, the election of the speaker got truncated. Then we had to enter into a room and then do some compromises and agree on a person to be chosen as a speaker. It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't happen that way. It shouldn't happen that way. Why should we be so antagonistic to ourselves to the extent that um, the uh, members are applying force to disrupt the conduct of elections. On three, four occasions, 
culminating in one person also snatching ballots. It was such a shameful day for all of us. The appeal to all of us is that it should not have federal progression, as I've said. And indeed, I agree with you that we, if we have to apologize a thousand times to the nation, we have to do that in order to pinch ourselves that it should never happen again. The issue that you raised that is filling vacancy in Parliament, as I said, um, is constitutional. Um, I, you know, I get a sense that you want to carry, that you think that it could be part of the amendments that you want to uh, proffer um, to the Constitution. I think it's, it's, it's a useful suggestion which we have to look at. The point, however, is we may have to look at the timing that is uh, if we have to do that because by-elections are also uh, vehicles that parties use to assess their own levels of appreciation by the voting public. So you cannot say that any person who backcase a seat you're live on the Joy News channel. This is the ongoing coverage of that leadership press conference in Parliament. Very soon, we will bring you the vetting of Minister of State and the Minister of Finance, Charles Edubwahin.